Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this digital marketing workshop series for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Today is session three of this four part series and our focus will be on SEO and paid ads. Your presenter for the series is Frank Correo from the Active Web Group, where Frank is a digital strategist and marketing manager. I'm your moderator, Renee Goodno from the New York Small Business Development Center. Today's host is the Mid Hudson Small Business Development Center. And joining us off camera from Mid Hudson SBDC is Vanessa Sikor. Vanessa will be available during the Q&A to answer any SBDC related questions. I think we have a lot to cover, Frank, so I will turn things over to you to get started. All right, guys, welcome aboard again. Uh, I'm glad to see you in week three here. Um, this presentation is probably my favorite of the four. This one is directly about uh, return on investment marketing. Um, so we're going to start to talk about how to get traffic to your websites and how to convert that traffic. Uh, so this is the most exciting one for me. Uh, so this is how does Google determine which sites to rank at the top of search engines. And again, I'm Frank Rayo with Active Web Group. Okay, so with this presentation, we are going to start to get into a lot of terminology. Um, there's no way around it. However, I am going to explain that terminology. Now, in no way do I expect anybody to become an expert digital marketing strategist at the end of this hour. I don't expect anyone to become a senior SEO specialist. Uh, my team has spent decades fostering those, uh, that knowledge. But what I do want you to know is I want you to take away some of this vernacular, um, some of the things that you can and can't do, and what to know and look for when you're, uh, when, whether you're hiring a team internally, you're hiring a digital marketing team like Active Web Group, or you're uh, thinking about doing some, uh, some things on your own. Okay, so going over important metrics. Now, the metrics are going to be the things that I measure in Google Analytics, which we're going to discuss next week. But these are the action points and the metrics that I want to see um, in order to know who's converting, if my efforts are actually working. Okay, so sessions and users. These measure the amount of traffic coming to the site. Um, how many sessions did a user have? So a user, I had 10 users that visited my website they had 15 sessions. So uh, on average, that means the page time is maybe 1.5. Um, new and returning visitors, uh, users. So these are repeat visitors versus new acquisitions. So I had someone new coming to my website versus someone I had returned to my website. Now, if you have a website that uh, relies on retention, let's say again, you're a fitness facility where you have members visiting and they're gonna go to the uh, the, the class schedule page a lot, right? To look at the class schedule. Um, we noticed that that's one of the top trending pages. Um, all my returning visitors tend to go to that page. That tells me members are finding their way to that page. Um, bounce rate. So these are users who are visiting the website. For some reason, they're getting off that website as soon as possible. It's time out to leave it. Um, what this means is a number of things. One in our web development conversation where we talked about page speed. If the site doesn't load that fast, maybe specifically on a mobile device, maybe again, you have a video there. Uh, but if you have something on your website that, you know, it's not loading or perhaps it's the wrong information, um, you have a pay-per-click landing page and you have a unique promotion, you're doing a Black Friday sale, but they land on the homepage and there's no information about Black Friday. So rather than scroll and look around, they quickly get out. Average page load time. So this tells you how slow your site is. How long does it take for a page to load? How long does it take for your site to load? Now, Google is going to assess based on one to 100 how fast your website is. There are other tools out there that determine site speed, but Google in terms of ranking is the one that matters. Um, they're gonna say, okay, your site ranks 20 out of 100, which means it's a slow site on desktop. It ranks 10 out of 100 on mobile, which means it's terrible. Um, then you have to look at your website and see what you can do to address it. And we'll get into that shortly. Um, organic versus paid sessions. So organic users are users, I'm gonna go into platforms in a second, but organic users are users coming in off of search. So they're organically searching for something. Whereas paid sessions are someone who's clicking on an ad. Um, top landing pages, what are the top landing pages visited? Again, we talked about um, in the case of the fitness facility, people going to the, um, the group fitness schedule page. In that case, what we're finding is we're getting members that come to the website and are checking out the group fitness schedule. Now, again, as we talked about in our web development meeting, if you have users who are um, who might be a new user, a first time user, however, that page, that group fitness page is well ankle, anchored, anchored in the search and SERPs, you're gonna find that you're gonna have a lot of traffic there naturally. 
If you have a lot of traffic to that page naturally, again, it's important to put a conversion point there. So we talked about where to put conversion points, what they are, how to achieve those. So this way we could capture new members as well. We could grab some prospects. Okay, what are channels or quote unquote platforms, which was like the traditional tried and true uh, method when in terms of advertising. We're talking about platforms, then we're talking about my direct mail piece, we're talking about my business card, uh, some distro material, maybe it's a trifold brochure, I have a billboard you know, somewhere. Uh, but what are channels? Channels are the following. So you have direct. Direct is someone going to www.com. So in our case, going to www.activewebgroup.com. Um, is that somebody who has found out about us through a digital marketing effort? Probably not. Um, so this is not a channel I traditionally say is tied into any kind of digital marketing effort per se. It can be, but um, nine times out of ten it's not. They've they've heard about you via word of mouth. Maybe they were given a tangible piece of material, as we just described. They saw your lo your logo and URL on a billboard, or they got a trifold brochure, or you shook their hand at a business conference and gave them a business card. So that is direct traffic. Organic traffic. So organic traffic is people searching for um, like-minded terms related to yours. Now this goes twofold. One, there's what we call branded terms. So brand terms are terms like active web group, um, active web, AWG, which is our acronym. Um, those are brand related terms. Now, if I know active web group and I am searching for them in Google, is that really uh, organic search? Not really, they're not organically finding me. So this is the first hiccup I see with a lot of, uh, oh no, two marketing terms, teams or people are related equally, you know, are equal to one another. I do not count brand terms. Brand terms are not really counted towards a goal in terms of organic. Paid is different, we'll talk about that in a second. But organically, if someone is searching for activewebgroup.com, they already know you. They already know us. They already know who we are. They just, instead of typing in a WW, they went into Google, you know, like your 75-year-old uh, your grandma or whatever, and they put that in. Um, so organic, though, there are also key terms um, related to who you are. So um, digital marketing services near me, uh, digital marketing team. Uh, those would be counted as an organic search if we came up in the search. Um, so what you have to do is you have to consider your target competition, um, what they may be ranking for and what you want to rank for, where your, com where your competitor might be, uh, your consumer might be searching for you. And then from there, you could start to figure out um, what do I rank for? How do I do it? Not all key terms are the same. Some are more difficult to rank for in others in what's called keyword difficulty. Obviously, soft drinks in terms of Coca-Cola is going to be a really hard uh, term to get to the first page of Google and rank number one for, right? But it can be done. Um, takes time. We'll get into that. Now, paid search. Um, paid search is um, essentially that. You're paying for a position, whether it be in Google or in the ad network somewhere. So I'm paying for a click. Um, how many clicks does it take to get someone to visit my website? And then out of those clicks, how many times does it take for somebody to convert? So there's specific math and numbers here to really ascertain the exact um, parameters for conversion. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. I'm going to get into strategy a little later in this conversation, but just know that. Now, in terms of brand uh, ads, so if I have active web group, as I said, organically, a brand term might uh, doesn't really constitute as an organic search because I know you. When it comes to a paid spend allocation, I may want to bid on my name. Um, I might see some competition bidding on my name, which is pretty commonplace. Now, it can be legal, it cannot be legal. Uh, there, If you have a trademark on your name, let's say I'm starting to bid on Coca-Cola's name. Um, Coca-Cola obviously has a trademark everywhere and anywhere. Um, they would then get that flagged by Google and get it taken down. However, if I can't prove that I have some kind of trademark or registered patent of some kind, um, then it's, it makes it harder or more difficult. So I might want to bid on my term. This way I'm showing up, you know, when someone's Googling me. Okay, uh, social, pretty straightforward. You know, you have various social media channels. Not all two are created equal. Um, I'm going to briefly touch on social media, but I'm not going to get so deep water into it. That's probably a whole other topic of discussion. Um, but again, various channels, you have your organic position, which is, you know, your daily posting or whatever your cadence of posting is. Um, and then you have your spend allocation. So a lot of these have spend allocations. There's also uh, influencer networks and things of that degree, which again, you know, not worth a dive here. But 
Um, but keep that in mind. If you have a specific uh, product or service which might work towards a specific audience, social media might be a good channel for you um, in terms of ad spend. Now you get a lower CPC uh, cost per click than you would with a paid ad traditionally. Um, your, uh, your bandwidth is a little lower than let's say you're put broadcasting it to the Google network. Uh, but you can start to get a little niche about stuff. And depending on who your target audience is, let's say you're looking for that uh, baby boomer uh, age group, you know, with uh, X disposable income who might be a homeowner, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Facebook might be a good place for you to do some ads. Um, if you're looking for more of a millennial mindset, you might have some shopping. And let's say you're selling some kind of lifestyle merchandise. Perhaps Instagram will work well for you. Um, again, your B2B, we know that that's LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera. So social media has its, uh, is a good tool. Uh, what I always say is if you're going to do something, do it 110%. Don't try and do all of them. Oh, I'm going to be on TikTok and this and that. Don't do it because you're not going to execute any of those at the end of the day. You're not going to have time. Um, do a couple of them. Do them well. Referral. So referral is a user coming in from outside the SERPs or the search engines. Um, there's a whole referral network, there's backlinks, yellow pages, for example. I got a, a link in a directory somewhere. Uh, so that's referral and email is pretty straightforward if I'm coming off an ancillary or affiliate email. So my email efforts, you know, whether it be through a bot list or some kind of other medium, um, I, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting traffic coming to my website through email. Now there's what they call UTM codes, which you should be placing into your URL structure. This way you know where that's coming from in Google. Next week's conversation, stay tuned for that about tracking. However, um, email, I do find a lot of times people are not tracking email properly, and then it will either end up in miscellaneous or referral traffic, which is wrong. So, you know, if you're spending money to uh, acquire an email list or you're jumping on someone's email list or you're doing something related to email yourself, um, you're going to want to track those efforts. So just make sure you're tracking that properly. Okay, KPIs. Key performance indicators. So these are measurable factors that tie into your business goals. Now, as we said the other, uh, was the last week when we were talking about websites, um, you have certain KPIs there on your website that might relate towards your business goals or your objectives. Someone clicks on the phone number, someone fills out a form, someone buys something on, uh, on your website. Those are your measurable factors. Now, with all that being said, the most important part of everything I'm going to say moving forward is data. So previously we talked more about design ethos and what looks good on a website and how to make a website form and function and how do we get people to uh, go on a journey throughout my website, right? Whereas, you know, a lot of websites are designed, they look pretty and great, but it doesn't convert. So we talked about that. Now, what about data? Um, data is king here. Data is going to tell me everything on the website. I've gotten asked a lot of questions about buttons and what to do and how to do it and what colors to make it. Maybe I'll make the button gray and the background of my website is, is black. Now, what I always do is I implement A-B testing. Um, I, based on all my years of, of doing this, will tell you the, you know, the brightest color that you could possibly pick is going to stand out. So if you have a red, you know, some good contrast with a red button and everything else is stark black or stark white or something, that's going to look good. That's going to stand out on your website. However, I could be dead wrong. Um, What's going to tell me that is data, and that's any true marketer. And that's the difference between digital marketing and tangible marketing. I could track all this. I could give you real-time data and numbers to tell you what works and what doesn't work. The thing is, it takes. Uh, it's almost like a game of chess, moving it around. So you, uh, I'm going to make the button red for a while. I'm going to measure that data. I'm going to give it the same time period next month. I'm going to make it blue. I'm going to look at conversions. I'm going to see how it works. I'm going to get a true A-B test, and then I'm going to know what is the best path towards conversion, where someone's going to click on the, the button. Um, and trivial stuff like that does matter. Now, related to data overall, the data is going to tell you uh, what your best tr channel is in terms of traffic allocation. Um, if you're doing a bang-up job with SEO or you're paying a lot of money for someone to execute some content, um, there you'll know, okay, my tr my top driving traffic driving channel is uh, organic search. Great, fantastic. Um, or maybe it's pay-per-click because I'm dumping a lot of money in pay-per-click. Or maybe it's direct traffic because I have a whole uh, street gorilla team that's going out and killing it. Um, so this will start to tell you where your money in, is uh, best utilized over time. Okay, there's Google Tag Manager. Now, Google Tag Manager is a great tool that works in tandem with Google Analytics where you're able to get a deep water dive into the user journey of a website. 
So um, they got five pages deep, they clicked here, they did this, et cetera. This is gonna help you really determine and hone in where, where a user is converting and where they're not. Now, the other thing that's great about Google Tag Manager, twofold. One is helps me uh, set up tags and goals. So all the buttons in, uh, on my website could fire off in a tier one, tier two, tier three goal set, as we spoke about last week. My favorite thing about Google Tag Manager is dynamically serving people information. So let's say I am a fitness facility and I have personal trainers. Um, I have personal trainers that cater towards students who are athletes, like high school football students. I have um, trainers who help, uh, you know, mom who just uh, had her first baby lose that, you know, that, that 15 pounds of weight that she's trying to lose. Or then I have um, my senior citizen fitness, you know, over the age of uh, 65, 67, just retired, you know, looking to stay in shape, you know, looking to run around with the grandkids. Those are three different uh, problem sets with three unique different problems. Now, what I could do on my website is I, based on the information from uh, your data that Google grabs, right? Privacy policy we'll talk about later. Um, but based on that information, I could dynamically serve you a special image. So when I visit the, um, the website as a, um, the captain of the high school football team, I'm gonna see a, a image of uh, you know, sports athletes training. If I'm a senior citizen, I'm gonna see people my age you know, getting, getting exercise. So you could dynamically serve people content based on who they are as a user. Great, great data sets and things to do in Google Tag Manager. It's very, very advanced um, and it's not really for every use case. However, it's something I did want to mention that does work in tandem with Google Analytics. Now, diving into SEO, and I'm gonna slow down a little bit here. Um, so related to SEO, there is a lot to talk about. Um, I'm not gonna talk about every single facet. We're not gonna go in the back end and start to uh, you know, implement titles, tags, metadata, et cetera. Um, I'm going to give you all the, the basic structure for how SEO operates. Now, the big thing I always see is I see signs on the, on the road. I'll get you the number one in Google or uh, number one in Google within a month. These are magic pills. There is no magic pill in terms of SEO, okay? Uh, every, it's consistency. You have to be consistent in your approach. You have to continually chip away at it. Now, as I gave you the example of Coca-Cola and soft drinks, so um, if I have, you know, I'm making, a, I'm making root beer in my bathtub, I can't expect to pop up a website and then tomorrow be out ranking, you know, Coca-Cola, A&W, all these brands for root beer, right? Um, so setting up a proper strategy based on your keywords is gonna help you. What you do is you start to look at your competition. Um, I may look at big box competition like Coca-Cola, like A&W root beer, I might not. Maybe there's something, um, more homegrown that's going on. Maybe there's uh, local artisans making this stuff where they're also ranking locally um, when I'm searching for something. So you have your local search and then you have your national broad stroke search. Uh, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in local search. I also find that most of small businesses really are more in tune with localized search, right? Um, I'm not gonna look for um, plumbers, you know, uh, national plumbers. If I have a, a problem with my plumbing, I'm gonna look for someone who's as close as possible, get to me as soon as they can. Um, you know, dollars and cents obviously become part of the, the opportunity here. You know, the cheapest guy or the, the most cost effective guy might get the bid. But uh, generally speaking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find someone who's in my backyard. <clears throat> this is true with a lot, of, a lot of businesses, a lot of business models. So look at some of your localized competitors and then get a few national examples. What's then done is a keyword research audit. So you do an analysis of all the competition, what they're ranking for. Um, some things are gonna have certain keyword difficulties. So certain keyword difficulty is gonna be harder. As I said, soft drinks, that's gonna take a long time to rank for. Um, but you're probably gonna see a lot of search volume there, right? If I took all my time writing content and gearing my website towards soft drinks, right? Within six months, I might not get to the first page of Google because again, it's so packed. Or even if I get to the first page of Google, there are so many ads on the first page of Google that I'm just all the way at the bottom and I'm not getting seen anyway. So is that worth my effort when I could type in like artisan drinks or something to that degree? Um, so knowing, having a plan of attack here in terms of keywords is going to be helpful. Um, there used to be the old adage, uh, you know, you pay for uh, ranking for 50 keywords or whatever a month. It doesn't really work that way anymore. Um, the way we structure the workload we do is we look at the low-hanging fruit, uh, the ones within quote-unquote striking distance. So if you already have a website 
you're already ranking for stuff um, on your website. If we see you're on page four for soft drinks, for example, maybe that's a term then, then that we want to start to attack instantaneously because it's already anchored in the search or in the SERPs, right? Um, so you have to look at all these things, you know, all these exit points and start to define a real strategy in terms of ranking. Now, with that being said, there are various tools and tricks here. There's content marketing. So whenever you see a blog, that's for a reason. Um, or whenever there's a lot of content on a website, that's for a reason. Um, I do find that everyone wants more of a pretty website. You know, pretty websites are usually light and airy, a lot of imagery, no real um, uh, copy. Or when I present a lot of copy to uh, to a, a client, um, they'll get a little excited that, oh, this is too much, no one's going to read it. The only reason why it's there is for Google to read it, right? Google's going to read your website like a book. They're going to look at the top, left to right, all the way down, top to bottom. Um, if you have things that are nested, let's say in a flyout menu, you have something that's got like an accordion, which is seen like an FAQ section where they'll nest the thing where it drops down. Very cute stuff. However, Google might not rank that. They might skip over that. So that was pointless. Um, so knowing what Google's actually going to look at is important. Um, and developing a content, a consistent content strategy here is going to help you moving forward. You think about the keywords you want to rank for, you think about the, the time of year, what's going on in the marketplace, and then you develop a strategy based on that, uh, whether you do a quarterly um, or you know yearly, whatever you're going to do, you create a calendar for it, a calendar for execution. Um, the question I'm going to get asked is how many articles or what do I do a month? That's going to really depend on uh, your cadence of how quick you want to get to where you got to go, right? Um, everything's really bandwidth. Um, but traditionally, you know, two to the four strong pieces, unless you have to do a lot of rewrites on your website, um, which then that will warrant more time, you know, more actionables in terms of content. But don't just write articles for the sake of writing articles. Don't write content for the sake of writing content. Write it thinking about your rankings and keep that in mind. Now, of course, there's tricks of the trade there with how much content to actually write, um, how many paragraphs, et cetera. Um, the one thing I will say is when people build a new web, when they think about building a website or they have a website that's terrible, right? I have this website. It's, uh, you know, this horrible Squarespace site that I just slap together, drag and drop just to get something up. Um, but, you, but you're already ranking for a couple things, right? Um, locally, at least, or, you know, what, maybe you're not. Maybe you're doing, maybe you're doing okay. Um, the you hire a web developer or some someone in their basement that's you know maybe not great i see that a lot but maybe you're uh you're hiring somebody to build a new website they're a great designer and they're going to build you a great website however they're going to omit all that copy and that's great seo that was in the back end they're just going to build you a pretty website now you have to start from scratch again which is the biggest nightmare so if you're already ranking for stuff and you're considering a um, an upgraded website or to upgrade your website for various reasons we might have already talked about don't don't omit what's already happened on your website or already exists. Make sure an, uh, an SEO team audits it, a good SEO team. Nine times out of 10, most web developers will not consider SEO strategy. Um, okay, so next is really links, right? Um, links is DA, domain authority. Um, Google is essentially going to say to you, uh, your site um, has this many links, so this is what we're gonna say the domain authority is. I'm gonna talk about how domain authority works in one of these slides here. But link backlinks and forward links on your website are going to be important to help you rank. You have your blog, which we talked about, the HTML or the code structure. So this is when we're talking about titles, tags, metadata. The metadata is like what's going on in the back end of the website that Google's then going to see and read. The um, titles and tags is the title of the actual website. Now, if you're trying to rank for a specific uh, key term on a page, you're probably going to want the title of the page to be similar, wink, wink. Um, so having some of these guidelines in place for the structure of your backend code is going to be uh, going to help you rank. When you have images, make sure you have all text. Um, all text is, let's say the image doesn't load, but that's also something Google's going to read. Um, so make sure all that stuff is properly in place. Marketing, of course, the marketing of it overall strengthens the, uh, you know, rises the ship here. We're going to talk about pay-per-click and how that works together in tandem. Uh, in a moment momentarily but that's exactly what i mean how everything is kind of working uh as a system you know a 360 approach here um the popularity of your site essentially is your domain authority um how many visitors are visiting your website or clicking from a, a third party the design of your website we talked about site speed and page load time etc and then everything works together 360 in your overall strategy here 
So there are a lot of moving pieces to SEO, uh, but these are the general rules of thumb. Now we talked about data, but Google Analytics is going to be king here. Google Analytics is gonna tell you about your traffic, your data, I'm gonna keep hammering this home. Google Analytics or any kind of analytics or metrics are gonna be vital in being a, um, a serious uh, entrepreneur who's looking at their digital strategy overall and making audits. How often do I check it out? It's not something you're gonna look at daily, right? You have your stock portfolios, you know, if you just looked at it yesterday, maybe not great, but it finished the day really good, right? Uh, maybe this morning, I uh, haven't checked yet, but maybe this morning it's down in the dumps again, you know, bad times. But that's, so that's not how, in the same way you would look at your stock portfolio, it's kind of how you look at Google Analytics. Maybe you're taking a monthly view at it, maybe you're taking a quarterly view at it, depending on your goals and how much traffic you get. If I only get 200 users, and any given month on my website, it might be good for me in terms of conversion. You know, I'm a smaller entity, right? Uh, so I don't need a lot of clients or not a lot of prospects to visit my website to convert and you know become a sale and for me to make ends meet. However, if I'm only getting 200 users, that's not a good uh, weekly or monthly pool to really make any you know as, uh, any any observations, right? So I'm looking at it quarterly. I'm comparing quarter over quarter. And once I have a full year of data, then I'm comparing it year over year and I'm seeing how I did because every year you want to get better, right? Every year you want to grow your stock portfolio. It's the exact same principle. There are thousands of factors here that go into ranking formulas for Google, right? Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of common factors that Google says here um, are going to be vital in terms of ranking. Now, some things Google will, it's pretty uh, obvious what Google's telling you that they want to rank for. There are other things where Google's like this mysterious, uh, you know, this mysterious entity that's just randomly going to make changes to their algorithm and it might throw you off. We'll talk about that soon, but just know there's a lot that goes on, you know, under the covers here. Okay, so content. Content again is king. Um, having enough content on your website will help you rank. If you have five pages on your website, that might not be enough. Uh, you, you're going to want to puff up your chest, so to speak. So the more pages you have, the larger your, your platform is, the, the larger your net is, the more chance you have to rank for things, the more Google has to read. If you're continually updating your website, Google loves that. So if you're updating every month with the content that I suggested based on blog posts, et cetera, um, Google's gonna say, okay, there's more content here. Um, make sure you're setting those pages to follow. Uh, a lot of times I'll see that the whole website is set to no follow. That means Google's not gonna index your website. So make sure all the structure is in place first in order for you to get up to speed. That goes without saying. Um, I do a lot of one-time SEO audits or setups where we'll set up a website um, that's ready for success. So something to consider as you, um, as you build your website to make sure that it's set up to be ranked. Now, there are a lot of different tools. We talked about various tools and CRMs and things of that nature. Not all two are created equal, obviously, and I have to mention that. So Wix has various tools, cute little you know, beginner tools in terms of ranking. Um, WordPress, for example, Notorious has Yoast and a couple other plugins. These are just template um, template tools, and they don't really give you the full understanding or the full scope in terms of ranking. There are things that happen outside of these tools that are used and done, or things that are counterintuitive to what the tool is saying. Uh, so take it as a guideline, but don't don't. Um, it's the same as what I said with branding and typography. If you don't know the rules, don't break them. So I suggest that. But if you start to understand the rules, it's going to be important in order to be a full, you know, um, a unique brand that you could break them. And the same is true with uh, with some of these tools. You know, in order to really be successful in ranking, there might be some things you have to do that are outside the what some of these little um, Q plugins are telling you. Keywords. We talked about keywords already, but keywords are king here. Um, if I'm writing content just for the sake of writing content with no real direction or destination. Uh, what's the point? Why are you doing it? Um, so know what the end result is or what the end goal needs to be um, in terms of ranking, what you want to rank for, um, how much volume a key term gets, how long do you think it's going to take you to get to the top of the search? Is it worth it to get to the top of the search? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Um, I'll give you an example. So let's say I am a scientific instruments company and I have some very niche unique products that you know, no one's really, I'm not searching for, uh, you know, a fancy type of Bunsen burner. However, um, my target market might, or is, they know exactly what they want as scientists and as professionals. So 
I'm going to want to target them. Now, that doesn't mean the keyword difficulty is going to be easy because your competition might already be aware of that. However, you might not see a lot of search volume with that term. Um, that might be an okay thing because, again, you're trying to hit a, a very niche target audience. So that is worth its weight in gold. So it's worth trying to get to the top of Google for that. Uh, maybe you're, um, you're a lifestyle brand, as I said. So you're very broad stroke in what you do, hats, t-shirts, et cetera. Um, in your lifestyle brand, you know, orientation. So your your keywords are a little more broad. Um, that also might mean more competition, but that might mean more traffic because you're going to have a lot larger of an audience who's going to look at this stuff. So something to keep in mind when looking at your keyword strategy. Okay, then skip one. Now we talked about the back end, you know, titles, tags, metadata. Here you see what the, um, you know, the meta name, the title, uh, the, the keyword, what keywords I'm going for, the description, et cetera. These are going to be important to make sure they're filled out. A lot of websites I look at, you know, when I go and I do, uh, you know, I right click and I'm inspecting element or I'm looking at the back end source code. I, I don't see any of this in place. Um, so make sure that your structure for your HTML is proper, something that Google is going to look for. Now, domain authority. Uh, we started to talk about domain authority. Domain authority essentially is a referral system that Google will say, okay, uh, these are like-minded websites, I'm gonna rank them. Um, the example I could give is if um, I'm looking for a job at Active Web Group, right? Um, I knew, I had a, a first person connection to Scott Ford, the, the, the founder and CEO of Active Web Group. Um, I got an interview because of that, right? Um, because I had some clout and some merit. Um, I got the interview and I got the job, hooray. Um, so I got that job. Because I did that, that was that was because of my ability to network, right? I kind of raised my stake or my, my equity there to get the position. Now, the same is true with domain authority. Um, so if there is a website that's really great, it has a lot of traffic, it's been around for a long time, it's within what you do. So if I am a automotive, auto parts company, I don't want to be on uh, brides.com. That doesn't make any sense. Google will start to recognize that and say there's no correlation there. However, if I got, um, I then got on, the, um, I don't know, I was on the NASCAR website or something like that, um, or I was on Kelly Blue Book, I had a listing, or some type of site that's really well anchored in search, I had a listing there. That's going to help my domain authority. The higher my domain authority, the better it's going to be for me to rank. So I'm working on everything else I did but I wasn't consider link building, uh, which is how you get your domain authority. I wasn't building links and I didn't build any links. I didn't have any backlinks. Um, uh, Google might say, you know, what? this this website isn't exactly what I thought the website was. The competitor has a lot of backlinks. We're going to rank the competitor ahead of my website. So don't skip out on domain authority. Some, um, some links are paid. We do a whole network of paid links. Um, I do it for most of my clients. Um, there's some freemium link, uh, link building you could do, but again, you know, you're limited there in your ability. Um, I always start by picking up the phone or sending out emails and seeing what directories I could get listed in for free. And then from there, I start to build out my, uh, you know, what I'm doing and there might be a paid allocation. You're going to get to a point where you're starting to rank for things, but you're going to be a little stagnant. This might be one of the factors here that's kind of hinging on you being more successful. Having a responsive website, we talked about responsive versus adaptive websites. Um, having a website that's uh, responsive for mobile devices, that's mobile to friend friendly, Google indexes things based on mobile first. So in a lot of cases, Google's gonna read your device, and read your uh, website and see how it looks first on a mobile phone. If it's slow, it doesn't load right, it's not responsive for a mobile device, Google's gonna skip it and not rank it, or it's gonna rank it very low in the totem pole. So you want to make sure your website is responsive or adaptive for a mobile device and it's loading at a fast speed on a mobile device. Site speed, again, I've already mentioned this, uh, but site speed is a big uh, big factor in determining uh, ranking. Um, if, you're, again, your site loads very slow, specifically on a mobile device, you're not going to get anywhere in terms of ranking. You're going to get stuck in the mud. So making sure that you have a fast site is going to be paramount. We talked about AMP already. Uh, these are things I want to re-mention to you. AMP is a tool from Google that will help you uh, will help you in terms of site speed. Of course, it's a Google product. Google smiles on that. Um, what it does is it strips down all the elements of your website to just boil it down to the most important, which is typically a headline, a singular image, kind of like some of these websites. They look more um, editorial 
in nature. Um, what I typically suggest here is you're going to have to make a decision of design and you know form and function together. See what's best for you. Um, I'm always battling the design team. You know, I come from a design background, but me now as an ROI marketer, you know, I need this thing to work. It's great to have pretty, you know, pretty pictures, but if they do nothing for you as a business owner, what's the point? Um, so you're going to want to kind of toe the line there and, and figure out what the best path is for you. I think a lot of times AMP or, you know, stripping down your website to this degree is a little bit much, but you, you know, you'll start to see traffic patterns and get an understanding of what needs to be done. If you notice that everyone's dropping off on a mobile device, some serious changes need to be made. Analytics will tell you that, wink, wink. Okay. Now the most important thing is give it time. Um, everybody that comes to me for SEO stuff and every single time I see a damn sign that says get you the number one in Google uh, within a month is total BS and I'm not a fan. Um, it gives a uh, complete lack of merit to what I do as a professional and I, I can't stand it. You have to give things time. I would never sell a magic pill because there is no magic pill. Everything in life takes time. It took you time to get to the, the decision to start a business. It took you a long time to get to where you are professionally to be able to do so, maybe monetarily, right? The same thing is true in terms of ranking and getting traffic to your website, getting that traffic to convert. Um, it's going to take time. Nothing is done overnight. So you have, to be, uh, you have to be vigilant. You have to be consistent. You have to be consistent in your approach in order to get to the top of the search. But if you start to implement some of the tools and tricks that I said here, if you're consistent in your approach to writing content, you're writing content with purpose, you're continually updating your website, you're considering titles, tags, and metadata when you build a new web page on your website, and you're building plenty of those web pages. You're thinking about form and function in terms of uh, mobile first indexing and site speed, and you're starting to get some links and directories and your site is not set to no follow, please do that. But um, if, if you do that, you give it time, you, you, you'll, you'll find yourself on a pathway to success. It's not a set it and forget it type of proposition. Okay, so Google algorithm updates. Uh, damn Google, uh, what are you doing to me? Um, so Google will change the way in which they rank and determine who ranks for things um, continually. They do this, you know, uh, they say they do it hourly. Um, they continue to do it. Some are small little tweaks, but some are major historic updates that really make a paradigm shift in what I'm doing. Here's an example of some uh, some some major updates that had have happened. You know, mobile first indexing, for example, that put a lot of my back in 2018. That put a lot of clients in a in a terrible position in terms of ranking where you know, we were considering what happens on the desktop. Now imagine I'm a B2B. Um, everyone's going to my, my website nine to five on a Windows computer. Um, you know, so I, I'm considering what my desktop solution is first. You know? um, but then this mobile first indexing hits and all of a sudden I have to retool my website to really you know, to, to buzz and hum for a mobile device. Um, this could be big. This could be a big thing and it could take a long time to get out of an algorithm update or some kind of change in terms of rankings. Um, Here's an example of that. So you'll notice what we call anomalies. There'll be an anomaly where, you know, again, this a lot of this starts to look similar to what you'll see in the stock market, um, where you have an upward trend and all of a sudden you'll jump off a cliff, right? And then you'll hear, oh, Google made a tremendous update to their website, to their uh, their uh, their ranking structure or algorithm. Now, when they do that. Um, the it's it gets a little hard a little tricky because google never says we uh we change our algorithm so we only care about mobile devices first they don't they've never they never release any of that information um the seo community kind of comes together and makes a decision about what's going on and what what really made a change i'm showing some data some other seo strategists is showing a data it's a lot of nerdy stuff um but any seo professional will have um uh, an understanding of what's going on, you know, within a couple of days. And then a strategy to get out of that, you know, is going to help you really, really execute that, you know, and, and get out of that and get back to where you were. But I have seen some revenue drop from some of this, um, you know, overnight. So being, and you know, your phone starts ringing. What happened? Well, I got no traffic on my website. I'm not making any sales. This could, this could kill your quarter. This could kill your year. Um, when that happens, it's, you know, again, having a professional that's going to be able to quickly get you out of that is going to be important. There's nothing here that I could tell you that will um, prepare you for that. 
and there's nothing here that I could tell you that will make you professional enough to uh, to be able to get out of that. You're just going to be, you know, uh, flailing your arms around, needing to get out of this as quick as possible so people start to visit your website. That's when I say it's time to pick up the phone and ask for a professional. I've seldom said this in these presentations, but this would be an example of that. Okay, now a lot of times I get asked questions about, um, um, Frank, um, Amazon is ranking number one for things. Uh, I, I'm never going to be there. They're the big box guy. Walmart's ranking number one for you know hats and t-shirts. It can happen. Here's an example of uh, a client that, that we made that so. So uh, again, this is something that took a couple of years to get to, um, but we we eventually ranked number one for a lot of this a lot of these terms. Um, and I've done this time and time again. So again, you know, you just have to be consistent in your approach um, if you want to be number one. Okay, something to consider too in terms of SEO is some outlier technology uh, patterns that are happening. Now, um, SEO, pay-per-click, any things I'm talking about here in terms of digital marketing, digital marketing strategies is always evolving. Uh, if you listen to this presentation in like a couple months from now, uh, maybe everything's completely different, <laughs> you know? Um, so keep that in mind, but always be on the lookout for something new that might emerge that might really tip the scale in terms of ranking. Uh, something I see as an example is uh, emerging search technology in terms of speaker assists. I'm not going to say her name, but it's the uh, the Jeff Bezos tool. Um, everything in my house will probably go off. Um, but so he's listening right now. Um, probably on a rocket ship somewhere with a cowboy hat. Um, but um, it's important to think about that because the way I would speak to a uh, a search assistant is probably different than the way I would type something out in Google. So if I'm to say to the speak assistant, um, um, how do you make a uh, how do you make a pizza? You know that might be different than the way I would Google it when I'm typing it. So you have what's called long tail keywords, which are long st structured, almost the way I would say them. Um, and then you have the the short tail version, right? Which are the you know the the more common they're they're typed in. You see see people typing a lot of things in Google and trying to get an answer. But um, but keep that in mind that you know if you have something that might warrant a speak assist. Um, keep, in, keep in mind some long tail keywords because there might be some low hanging fruit there that your com competitors aren't ranking for. And again, that gives you an outside the box, um, you know, a, an example of that where, you know, um, a, a tool or a new tool or a new piece of technology might aid in my ability to, uh, to find new consumers easily because there's not a lot of people in that market space yet. Okay. Uh, so that's a lot on SEO. Again, the whole point of SEO from in that discussion was not for me to make you guys senior SEO specialists, because if you are, I would hire you. Um, my goal is to get you to understand some of the lingo, um, not think it's just a magic pill when you see a yard sign, you know, when you're driving past the deli in the morning and say, I could get to Google, you know, these are people stealing your money. Um, it takes time, it takes consistency, it takes a professional approach, and you have to know what tools and what parameters to pull out of it in order to find uh, your, your niche in terms of ranking and get to number one. Nobody's going to page two in Google. No one's scrolling all the way to the bottom to find you. You have to be really on that first page, uh, and you have to really be number one, two or three. You know, people might click on a second or third one too. Um, however, something I see a lot, and now we're going to get into the ads conversation and why ads matter and when they might matter for you guys. Um, so, and I'm definitely running out of time here. Um, so Google ads now ads essentially are like, like I suggested before, when you're searching for something, you'll see the little ad button right here. Here's an example of an ad, uh, where you have that, that's an ad. And then you start to see stuff organically. Now, um, a good position would be to dominate search. So I'm appearing at the top. Whereas then I'm appearing organically. So I'm paying for an ad position, then I'm at the bottom. So there's a lot of chances for my consumer to click on my, my ad. Another example would be I'm just getting a website up and going. Um, you know, it's going to take me a while to rank for things. I'm consistently working on that because, again, the best place you could find yourself is organically ranking for something and not paying for an ad position. I don't want to give Google all my money, right? I don't want to give Mark Zuckerberg all my cash. He's got enough houses. What I want to do is I want to organically rank. This way, naturally, people will find me. Um, now, all you're paying there is you're paying for your, your team's effort to do that, as opposed to paying your team's effort and then paying, you know, um, 
Mark Zuckerberg for ads or you know paying the guys at Google for ads. Um, but there might be some reasons why you want to want to um, essentially position an ad. Um, one again, as I said, you have a new website. Uh, maybe there's a lot of competition, and you're no, it's just you're not going to get to the top of Google. Um, so having an ad position there might be uh, might be a good way to go. Soft drinks example that that could be an example. Uh, that's going to be an exam uh, an expensive uh, expensive key term. I'll tell you that, but that might be a good keyword group to start to invest some some money in where you're ranking and where you're showing ads. The other thing um, I always say bridge the gap. Now if there's something I'm trying to rank for, I've been chipping away at it. It's going to take a long time. Maybe I want to show an ad position there. Um, maybe all my all my um, competition they're uh, they're now showing ads for my name and I can't do anything about it. Maybe you now need to show ads for your name, right? Maybe you could show ads for your com competitors' names, um, which is sneaky stuff that I don't really like to do business with. But you know, again, everything has its place. Um, but again, I like to, I like to make sure things are done properly and things are done professionally. Um, but do keep in mind there are plenty of people out there that don't have that same uh, <laughs> same mindset. Um, now, um, so there are various reasons why you're going to want to show ads. Um, knowing what keywords to bid on, what has the best value, value in terms of keyword, setting up groups of those ads so they're not exact match. An exact match would be build a marketplace here. Uh, that would be like an exact match term where I'm, I'm specifically bidding on that, but I could build on build plus market plus place. So any variation of that will come up. That's called an ad set. I have different ad sets set up. Um, so these are your traditional um, ads within Google. Then you have your shopping ads. So if you have a shopping cart within on your website, you can set up um, your website to now have sponsored ads that show up in Google. And then in the shopping feed, which is the second tab over, there are freemium tools for the shopping, which work more in tandem with organic SEO. But if you could pay for a position here to, to rank for some things, this one, for example, is um, uh, bidding on a brand term for themselves. Then you have your display ads, uh, your network ads. These are the ones that will show up um, on websites, you know, the visual ads. You'll see them in various sizes, shapes, and forms. Uh, these ones are great, you know, to get some clicks. I do find the Google, the general Google display ads are the best ones because people are searching for something what they think is organic and they're clicking on your ad. These ones I'm going to be on someone's website and I'm going to find or I'm going to be somewhere on the internet and it's going to show up. Now, these do work in a remarketing sense that um, with remarketing ads, those are ads that follow you around the internet after you search for something. There's no voodoo magic there. Um, at some point, you did search for something or you, you were looking at a product. You know, I'm, uh, I'm looking for, a, you know, a, um, uh, some Klein electrical tools. Um, and all of a sudden, Klein Electrical Tools are following me everywhere I go. You know, I'm on Facebook, I'm on, I'm on Yahoo, I'm, I'm on CNN.com. Just follow me around the world. Um, that is, uh, that's because someone paid for that position. Klein Tools paid for that position to be there. This is how remarketing advertising essentially works. So I visited the website, or I've searched for something like-minded from the website. Um, again, I visited ClienTools.com, or I searched for Klein Tools in some capacity. Um, I've exited the website. Now all of a sudden I'm going to get shown ads that aren't on the website, aren't on the client website until you know eventually I make that user intent for the purchase. Uh, once I made that purchase, I'll no longer see that ad. That is a position that's getting paid for once somebody clicks. That's why they call it pay per click because you're not getting paid to be seen, you're getting paid for the click. So I, it's 50 cents every time someone. Uh, let's have more round or dollars. So it's a dollar every time someone clicks on my ad, right? I know that I need um, I need 10 users to visit my website to get one conversion. So it costs me $10 to essentially get a conversion. It's a dollar for the click, $10 for the conversion, right? That's when you start to say to yourself, okay, um, my shoes, uh, they, cost, they cost $110. So spending $10 for a conversion is worth it for me. That works within my marketing budget. Um, whereas maybe you're selling um, toothpaste that's $5.99, the conversion is worth $10.99, is $10. Maybe that's not worth it. However, maybe you have um, some kind of um, retention tool and your consumer life cycle is longer. You know, you're HelloFresh and it's a 10 weeks on average that someone is there. You know, maybe you're a fitness facility and you're charging monthly for your services. 
So whereas uh, in the short term, you know, there's a short term loss, there's a long term gain. So you really have to consider how your business works overall in terms of uh, consumer life cycle and what makes sense in terms of spending on ads. Um, giving you the dollar versus ten dollar example is very extreme. You know, you're not going to spend that on a click. Uh, maybe, I mean, unless you have some kind of crazy terms, but it is possible as well. I'll say, but it's more than likely not the case. Spending ten dollars to a dollar to acquire ten, so I get ten clicks to acquire one. That's re a really good conversion rate. On average, you'll see like a two to three percent conversion rate for someone who's really successful. So keep those things in mind. Okay, now the pay-per-click process here, as we went over the, the SEO process, you have your initial keyword research. You're then gonna start to create your ad sets based on those keywords. So you're gonna wanna speak to people in terms of the keyword group. Um, you're gonna wanna have, and that's the terminology, the vocabulary that's there at the bottom of the ad. Um, I'm gonna go backwards here, but you'll see here, quick setup, no developers needed, blah, blah, blah. You could have a couple sentences um, and you could have some featured areas where people could go to your website and click on various um, areas like the different um, different navigational elements. So you wanna set up your, your, um, your ad efforts, your keyword efforts to match and then your copy to match that. Okay, then you have your landing page development. Again, as I said, um, you're going to want your landing page to really speak to your ad set. You want it to be as um, as specific as possible. If you're just going to the homepage, you might lose consumers and they might bounce off. And then you've just paid for a click for no reason. Big missed opportunity that I traditionally see. Um, setting up your account in, in AdWords, you know, there's a whole setup process there. Now you're going to want to set up your tracking parameters for Google Analytics. Um, make sure you're testing those ads, make sure everything's firing off properly, all your triggered events are happening. So this way you know as you get as much data as possible within Google. So this way you could say to yourself, okay, it's working or it's not working. You're gonna launch your campaign and you're gonna continue monitoring your performance. Um, similar to SEO ads, number one miss I see, or the number two I should say, because landing pages is huge. Uh, the number two I see is uh, setting it and forgetting it. Uh, this isn't one of those scenarios. You're playing chess essentially. You know, you're moving things around. You're moving your bid allocation around. Um, I so I'll give you an example. Of something that's silly. Um, I'm a B2B. Uh, I'm in the manufacturing arena, and I'm located in the United States. Uh, my ads are showing up at three o'clock in the morning in Bangladesh on a Saturday, and people are clicking on there. How much of a wasted spend is that? Um, so you really want to consider the parameters in which you're showing ads. You might find that the most traffic comes to your website at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. Um, so you want to make sure you're showing ads then to maximize the possibility of conversion. Or you might say to yourself, you know what, I have a real lull, you know, Thursday at 12 noon. Maybe that's when you want to show your ads to really pick up traffic at that time period. So working in a full, you know, 360 scope here will kind of help you bridge the gap and get full uh, full visualization to get as many users as possible to click and convert on your website. But again, uh, you'd have to assess your goals and know where there's some holes in those goals. Um, campaign launch, we talked about monitoring the performance. Uh, we're gonna assess that campaign based on what I've just said. And then feedback and analysis, and you kind of continue that cycle again. You're gonna continue to make changes here until you find the path of least resistance. And then you're gonna find that with SEO, um, you're spending, so I'm not ranking for something. Google's gonna say this has nothing to do with my website because I'm not ranking for it because I just got started. So I'm bridging the gap by running ads, but slowly I'm working on my SEO strategy. So I'm slowly starting to rank organically and climb up to search. Google's gonna say, okay, this website is about cheese. I didn't think it was at first, but it has something to do with cheese. Uh, it's on page 10 of Google, uh, but it's something about cheese. Now. Then when you're bidding on your cheese terms, that cost per click might go down because you're now, you know, Google is, is crawling your website and saying that there's a match there. Um, over time, as you continue to work on your SEO strategy, you climb up the search, you're then going to start to see your CPC go down. So again, everything kind of works 360 in approach here. Okay, and that's essentially my presentation here for um, SEO and pay-per-click. I went over a lot. There was a lot of vocabulary, a lot of things to know and say. Um, the two areas I specifically did not touch on on purpose was I didn't really touch on email marketing. I did not touch on social media marketing. That was done intentionally. Um, these are tools of the trade, and there are other ancillary tools. There's a whole referral network, um, an affiliate network. Scott Ford is, a, is an expert affiliate marketer. Um, there's plenty of other things to do digitally. Um, 
in terms of email marketing, you know, we talked about that, making sure all your nurture emails are set up right. Thank you for shopping, abandoned cart, follow-up emails. If you're a contact submit, having a newsletter, which if you're writing a blog, there's a good opportunity to send out two newsletters a month. Every third position perhaps could be some kind of salesy position, but don't make everything a salesy position. Um, if you're buying a, um, a list, I recommend it sometimes. Sometimes I don't. Um, you know, I'm always fighting with the email team on that um, because you know I want to hit every single avenue as possible and see where I might strike gold. You never know. Um, so anything is worth trying out. Trying out, right? But not all lists are created equal. When you buy a list, there's a lot of uh, junk in there. There's spam traps and things of that nature. So you have to you have to strip these lists down so you don't get penalized and locked out of your email magnet account. Um, there's a lot of things there that happens in terms of emails, your subject line. You don't want to see the word sales a lot. So there are various tools and things to do in terms of email. And then with social media, what I always say is less is more. Uh, if you can do fewer uh, platforms and do them super effectively, you're on the right path. If you're a business owner, a small business owner, and you're spending all your time on Facebook, you're probably not going to find yourself successful. <laughs> I will say. If you're spending all your time in Google Ads, same thing here you're probably not going to find yourself super successful because you're spending your time becoming a, a Google Ads expert. And maybe we want to work together. Um, so don't spend all your time in the weeds. The whole purpose of this, again, was so that you guys understand what, what everything is so you don't get sold a bill of goods um, by whoever you're going to end up working with. Okay, um, I think we'll uh, open her up to questions now. Will a do domain that has keywords in it be a better... Yes and no. Um, I always say um, as specific as you could get to your industry is better. The problem you do have with um, uh, with domains in general, we went over this in the web presentation, was that it's getting very hard to find a domain, you know, um, you know, because there's so many of them. During the dot-com boom, everyone bought up all these domains. And still to this day, people are buying domains like crazy. So you're starting to see business names that are just wild and out there. Zanzadu uh, Cleaning Services or, uh, <laughs> you know, there's like uh, all these crazy names for things. Um, and that that's, again, because it's getting harder to find a website and it's getting harder to come up with a business name. Um, but I would say if you could have it within your tagline model. So um, if you're, uh, you know, uh, what I say, Zanzadu Cleaning Services, Zibba Zappa Cleaning Services. Um, if, if you could acquire that domain, cool. Uh, you know, you might not be able to get Zibazaba, but you could get Zibazaba cleaning services, and that will be helpful for you. Yes, and it's also going to be helpful for you in terms of you know quickly identifying who you are to the consumer. Uh, let's see. Okay, I own several related domains to my business: widgets.com, greatwidgets.com. Great, great, great. Uh, they each point to my main website. Are they helping me with SEO? Or am I wasting money? No, um, I mean, I don't know necessarily that there's any inherent value in terms of SEO. Um, perhaps there is, you know, if you're not ranking for it or Google doesn't see that, you know, you have anything to do with widgets, um, maybe not. Uh, but I will say that the more domains you own, the less chance your competitor is going to be able to scoop them up. So keep buying them, or keep renewing them. Uh, should a lot of content that Frank mentioned for Google be on the homepage or other pages? Should the homepage be designed for interest or content? Both. Um, so you want to, every page needs, uh, you know, at least a couple paragraphs of content. It's going to need a couple paragraphs with uh, clearly defined key terminology that you're trying to rank for. You have a lot of your backend structure set up, right? You know, there's no missed alt tags or anything of that nature. Um, but all pages need content. Um, those cute parallax pages where you just have visual, you know, great imagery, et cetera. It's not going to be great in terms of SEO. But what I will say is that, um, there's a fine line there and I understand that. Whereas me as an ROI marketer, um, I wanna have, I, I literally wanna put the Gutenberg Bible on every single web page. Uh, <laughs> however, me as a, a visual person, you know, if I have a photography website, for example, I'm gonna want my images to be highly showcased and I'm not gonna want people to get hung up on all this vocabulary. So um, putting it in the proper place, the proper context will be helpful. All right, where are we? Uh, to should Frank okay you mentioned demographics I am a startup what is the best way to search for my customers life lifestyle in reference to digital marketing for my online store okay my business mentor uh, referred to me me to the library cute uh, <laughs> but it seems to be for brick and mortar businesses okay uh, there's plenty of tools there start with your competitors 
uh, you have competitors. When you do a competitor uh, analysis, you know, you have that little grid. I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but you start to say, uh, you know, where, where you lie in your competitor space. Um, when doing that, every, some people will say, oh, here's, there's no competitors anywhere. That is not true. And if there are no competitors and you've done that exercise before, maybe there's a reason there's no competitors in the space, right? Maybe there's no, there's no business for that, you know? So um, there are no customers who want to purchase your goods or services there. That's why no one's in that sweet spot. However, so there's going to be competitors in your peripheral. They're going to have websites. You want to look at what they're doing, see how they're executing it and how they have consumers and they're, they're getting traffic to their website. And you want to try to kind of mimic and do better on that. So it's going to start digitally. It's going to start with looking at your competition, building a, a profile based on your target consumer. You know, um, I sell, um, uh, what do I sell? Um, I sell pickup trucks. So, um, you know, I'm looking at um, generally, uh, you know, a male between the ages of 25 to 55, pretty broad, right? Um, who works, you know, in a trade profession, who may be always searching for tools and things of that nature. So you're going to start to build a user profile based on that. Uh, let's see. How do you set up for Google Tag Manager? Uh, do you got a month? Uh, would the different groups of people see different pictures on the website? Okay, so this is something done in programming. This is a very, um, and I was a little apprehensive about mentioning it. When you give an example for daycare, the target audience, yep, parents versus grandparent. Okay, so if you have a very simplistic website and you're only looking to attract a couple people, it might not be worth its time of programming to do something like that. What you can do is create unique landing pages and try to rank for terms that maybe each one of those would search for. Or you could show ads uh, to ad group sets for each one and see which one converts better. That's probably what I would do. Um, when I'm on the website, I'd probably show um, uh, different imagery for each one. Again, it's something you can do in Tag Manager. Tag Manager is very complex. Um, it's very deep water. I have um, experts who are still learning things on the daily, so it's not something I could teach you, you know, overnight how to do. Um, but the, so the core things you need to do is make sure you have Google Analytics properly set up. Uh, make sure you have all your tags on your website fired off properly, so you're seeing what goals are being triggered. You know, your tier one, which might be your contact submit form, your tier two, which might be your phone number, your tier three, which might be an email, maybe or download a white paper or something to that degree. So you have all those goals set up appropriately. Once you have that and you have all your bases set up, then you could start to think about something a little crazier like Google Tag Manager. But if your uh, your website's not set up properly, you don't have proper CTAs in place. You know, your website's a little scattered from a brand vernacular standpoint, then I would start there before you start thinking about Google Tag Manager, which is why I was a little uh, a little scared about mentioning that. But again, I want to give you guys all the, uh, you know, the odds and ends that I possibly could. What's a CRN setup? Okay, so it's not CRN. Um, a CRO is what I might have said, or um, there's different different uh, acronyms with C's in here that I probably said. Um, CRO is a, a content rate optimization or a conversion rate optimization. Um, so conversion rate optimization is um, the, the, the different parameters on my website that I have that get somebody to convert. We talked about that last week in my, um, in my presentation for web development. So getting somebody to convert on a website essentially. Um, and how do I do it? Where do I put my buttons? Where do I put my forms? Uh, where do I put my call to actions, which might, might be my headlines, et cetera? Things like that. That's CRO conversion rate optimization uh what's your opinion about uh card.com one page website um rather than do um if that's your website rather than uh go on and look at it now next week what i'm doing is i'm doing um we're going to go over google analytics we're going to look at tracking and metrics and you know we're going to dive in um, i have a dummy account it's going to be a fun time if anyone wants to share anything, it's going to be an open forum for people to present and talk about questions. I'm hoping in that presentation, maybe you guys want to uh, speak directly. Um, but if you have something specific about your website that you want to go to, um, email me. Um, I know that uh, we're, when uh, you get to follow up emails here, that uh, my email is in there. Email me. We'll set up a time where we can go through directly. I've done that with a couple people already, um, and I, I think they've they've seen uh, uh, positive uh, positive results because of it. Um, how, do how to research for keywords? Any suggestions for website help? 
Okay, Laura. Uh, keyword research. So there are tools of the trade for that. You have various tools um, that you could use. They're all most of them are paid, um, paid tools and a little complex. Um, again, the purpose of this presentation wasn't here to uh, get you to be an SEO expert. You know, SEM Rush is one of them, for example. But the the whole purpose of that wasn't really to get you to to learn how to do a keyword audit. It's to you know tell you that, that you should get that whenever you go to a key uh, an SEO specialist or you hire somebody to do those services. But what you would do is you would put together your competition, your top five competitors, three to five competitors who are ranking for things. Um, I get competitors a lot in a competitor audit where my client or prospect will give me some competitors, but then they're not ranking for anything. So it doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't help me. And I have to do a little more research or dive a little deeper. So what you want to do is you want to look at some competition who might be ranking for things. Um, you then want to look at some like-minded key terms that you are not ranking for, find where that gap is, and then start to build your own wish list of things you want to rank for in juxtaposition to what they're ranking for. And also things that you should be ranking for that no one is ranking for. Um, there might be search volume for it. There might not be. If there's no search volume, it could be a good thing. I gave you that niche example. Um, it could not be a good thing. You know, maybe no one wants that product or service. So, you know, there's, there's various uh, outlets there. Could you review conversion points? Oh, and then you said any suggestions for website help. That kind of goes along with uh, question number six. Shoot me an email. We'll spend some time together. Um, could you review conversion points again and where to put your conversion points? Okay, Laura, uh, I can. Um, essentially, um, the, I know you could look at the previous presentation in the video, um, but you know you have your above the fold stuff, so things before you scroll down on the website. You have your hero image, which should have a nice conversion point or CTA. Uh, you have maybe above there a top rocker with your phone number. Maybe there's some kind of login path there. Uh, what you want to do is dynamically rule thirds, bring somebody using utilizing color or something throughout the website so the, the logo has red in it, and then there's a button over to the right or Reddit. And then my hero image has a red, you know, shop now or something like that. And then midway through the website, when I'm scrolling down, there's a form submission. So there's again, there's a cadence, but you could uh you can listen to that presentation. If you're the same Laura in number seven, when we spend some time together, I'll uh, I'll go over with the, I'll look at your website and we'll go over it. Uh, where would I look for no follow? Okay, so uh, if you have a WordPress uh, site, for example, um, there'll be, uh, uh, if you're downloading, uh, what's that, that Q tool that they have, uh, Yoast. Uh, Yoast is good sometimes, not good other times. Again, you know, professional avenues there. We follow it, but then we don't follow it. Um, if you are looking at it, you'll see some pages are set to no follow. Um, you just want to make sure they're set to follow is all. Um, other tools like, um, Squarespace and things like that. It's a little trickier, you know. Not all tool, not all these website platforms are created equally. I will say that. Uh, where would I? Okay, now we answer that. Uh, it sounds like I should have keywords somewhere in the content. Yes, <laughs> yes, you should. Um, so um, you don't want to keyword stuff. You don't want to have a thousand keywords in there, but you want to have enough that it makes sense. And again, um, typically you want a well-structured article that uh, hones in on one key term. You don't want to have talking about six different terms. Um, you want the page to really speak to one. So Google says, okay, this page is about, uh, this page is about crock pots. It's not about crock pots, toasters, and, um, and, and water pistols. It's only about crock pots. Cool. I'm going to rank this page for crock pots. If Google sees a lot of stuff going on, it's not going to know what to do with the page. Um, so, you know, you sprinkle it in, you don't stuff it. So you don't put it in 16 times. You just put it in enough. It's in your title. It's in your tag. It's in your metadata. You know, it's in the description of the website. And then it's, uh, you know, peppered in three or four times throughout the, uh, you know, your three to five paragraphs. That should that should start to, to push the peanut forward. Just to clarify, SEO are the keywords that are within your site. Kind of, uh, which search engines pick up on. I, I guess you're simplifying, but yeah, there's back-end stuff that we talked about that happens there. But uh, essentially, Google's reading your website back and front. You know, they're reading it like a book. And then they're saying, okay, this site is about, um, you know, uh, uh, this, this, this site is about crockpots. Let's rank them for crockpots. And then, you know, as you're working on your website and re-indexing your website, you're working Google Search Console, which I didn't talk about that on purpose, but you're working Google Search Console. Um, from there, you're going to start to, uh, and you're fixing all your, you know, you get 404 errors, you get certain errors on your website. 
404 errors. See, as I say things, then I have to <laughs> explain things. Uh, 404 errors are if you know the, the page is not found or whatever. Google's going to then say, uh, you know, this 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 site is a mess. Uh, so you have to redirect that link that you might have deleted that page to the home page or somewhere that makes sense. So again, and that's why I think it was search Google Search Console conversation. But um, but yes, you're you're simplifying. But yes, Google's reading your website. They're saying what key terms you might be ranking for based on your descriptions, and then it's putting you in a position for them. Um, I structured my uh, I constructed my website, and on the back end, there's an SEO portion. I haven't really figured out how that this option works. Okay, again, that's one of those tools. I don't know what CMS you're using, what website. You know, if you're using a builder, it's hard coded. You're using WordPress. Um, but no tools are created equal. Um, some of them they offer some things, but they're you know they're not the greatest. Um, you know I'd have to look at that individually. Um, and there's a lot of vernacular there with some of those tools, like Shopify for example has an SEO tool, but it's going to use a lot of lingo that I just talked about. Um, so you know that's the, that was the purpose of this conversation. Um, in my business, I am planning how will these tools help me in the area of social services and treatment programs okay um it will because people are you know people are searching for social services and treatment programs and options um so you want to be ranking for some of these things uh you probably are localized um so you want to be ranking on a local level if that's that's so so you want to look at some of the things around you um if you're a nonprofit, there are some things you could do in terms of ads where you could get an ad grant it's a little tricky. I can navigate you through that, but um, it, it can be a little tricky to get Google to give you money, uh, but they do do it. Um, so I would say you probably need to show up some ads. You probably need to have uh, you need to have a great SEO presence in place. Your follow up needs to be paramount. So, you know, people looking for social services and treatment, maybe not so great at following up. You know, I, I'm not typecast anybody, but you probably want to make sure similar to that doctor's visit that you're going to have where there's multiple follow ups. I mean, my damn dentist won't leave me alone um, every six months. Come on now. Um, but uh, and I'm grateful for it. But um, but you want to have reminders and follow up. So you want to make sure your email magnets and stuff are on point to do that. So a robust CRM would probably be somewhere I would start as well. This has been a great session, Frank. I so appreciate it. And I'm definitely looking forward to next week. Is there anything that folks need to do homework wise to prepare for next week? <laughs> Yeah, so next week we're going to be going through data analytics. Um, I'm going to be showing you a couple things to look for. Uh, we're really going to like uh, go through Google Analytics as a whole, look at a dashboard. I have a dummy dashboard set up, so there won't be a lot of metrics, but we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the areas you might want to look at. Uh, we're going to tie in what we talked about this week in terms of platforms. So when we talk about, you know, um, uh, Google pay-per-click, different channels, we talk about, um, you know, uh, various various tools of the trade and various terminology. We're going to look at that and how that matters in terms of analytics. Uh, what, again, what to look for, what not to look for. Um, make sure your dashboard is set up appropriate to what you need to see so you can do accurate reporting. And then any, we're going to really workshop some questions in terms of ROI marketing. Uh, I really want to hear from you guys. Um, you know, if there's anything you want to show or you have any feedback, that's going to be half of the intent. So I'm probably going to spend 25 to 30 minutes there on analytics. Um, and then we're going to spend the rest of the time just chatting and being friends. Frank, again, thank you so much. We appreciate your time, especially with these questions that you answered. And we definitely look forward to next week.